Father, thank you that we could be here today, Lord, for the great joy and blessing we've already gotten to experience with New City leading us. Um, Lord, thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ that we can just uh, sense the spirit move between us when we're together. So be with us now, Lord, as we look into your scripture, Lord, a, a fitting sermon as we consider these young leaders who just led us today, Lord, and we look at this young leader, Timothy, and Paul's instructions to him. So be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. So we are going through the book of 1 Timothy, and we're looking at what does it mean to be a godly leader? What does it mean to be a godly leader? Uh, Paul writes this letter to his young protege, Timothy, sending Timothy out into the world. And he's saying to Timothy that as you lead this church in Ephesus, you're going to have people who challenge the pure doctrine of God from two sides. You're going to have people who challenge it by bringing religious systems to it, by trying to force religious criteria, by trying to force what you know, we will look at today is called the law. That There were people who would come into the churches after Paul left, and they would begin telling people, Basically, uh, that Jesus is good, but he's not enough. You know, Jesus is good, but if you really want to be a Christian, you have to follow all of the, the laws in the Old Testament. But you're not only going to get the challenge from the religious side, but you're going to get challenged from uh, the worldly side as well. That there are going to be people who come in and they're going to, you know, be teaching in the church that certain lifestyles that, are, that the scripture speaks against are actually allowed. Or they're going to condone behavior that God doesn't condone. And so Paul says, you know, you're going to have to navigate these things, and I think that's true for every single one of us, that every single one of us is a leader, that in the kingdom of God, we're called to go out and teach the gospel to, to be people who, whether you're leading one person or whether you're leading an organization, to be people who stand firm in the faith, know how to navigate those challenges. And so that's what we're trying to take from this. And Paul says to Timothy in verse 5, uh, our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So that's what we're looking for. How do we do that? How do we make our charge this love? So I'm going to read to us, because Paul is going to clarify for Timothy what he thinks of the law. So in other words, you, 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 these teachers were coming in. They were saying, you must follow the law. Jesus is good, but he's not enough. Um, so now Paul is going to talk about what he thinks about the law. First Timothy 1, verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted." I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I want to consider first how Paul views the law, and then we'll close with three things that we need as leaders. The law for Paul, the law is for the unjust. Now, if you want to interpret a letter like this that Paul's writing, we have to acknowledge and remember that Paul is writing to somebody who knows him. You know, Timothy has spent decades with Paul. Uh, Timothy knows Paul's theology. Timothy understands where Paul's coming from. He knows Paul's language. And so Paul is writing this personal letter to him, and he's not going to include everything that he believes, all of his theology. He's not going to explain it as deeply as he does in some of his other letters. 
So to really understand where Paul's coming from, you need to let Paul interpret Paul. You, you need to look at his other letters to get the full catalog of what he believes. And one of the things that Paul believes is that the law was given so that we would no longer be ignorant to what God's ideals for us are. I've said that the gospel is the way to be fully human. The gospel is the way God intended you to be. So when we look at the law, what we are looking at is God's instructions for how to be fully human. God's instructions for how to live in to everything that he intends to you, not just to protect your own humanity, but to protect and encourage the humanity of others. When Paul is speaking about the law, he talks about it in categories of ignorance or awareness. You either don't know the law and you're ignorant, or you do. In fact, Paul applies uh, that to himself. He says that before he was a persecutor, you know, he was, he was a murderer. You know, he was a liar. He was all these things, many of these things that he lists out. And he says he did that because he was ignorant. He's saying, I didn't know any better. I wasn't aware of the truth. Now, when he becomes aware, he becomes guilty. That's the way that Paul views the law. So he says to the Romans, where there is no law, there is no transgression. If you don't know the law, you can't break the law. Or you can't be held accountable to it. But once you know the law, then you become guilty. And that's true about all sorts of laws. Whether it's God's law, societal laws. You know, if you didn't know you were breaking a law, it's hard to hold you accountable to it. But for, there, are, there are all sorts of laws that we know about, natural laws, you know, things that, you know, when you open up the scripture and Cain kills Abel, um, he didn't have to be told that murder was wrong. He knew that murder was wrong. In Paul's mind, what the law does is it comes in and it sheds light on the ways that we are living that are contrary to God's intentions. The law comes in and shows us our ignorance. So he sees the law as full of compassion, it's intended to help people who are living in ignorance to come to awareness of how they are essentially destroying themselves and others. Now, what the law can't do is ultimately change you. The law can show you your disobedience, but this is what Christ has come to do. Paul says that Christ comes to justify us through faith so that now we have his righteousness, a righteousness that couldn't be attained through the law. Our hearts are actually changed. Here's why we're talking about all this. In Paul's logic, you essentially have three types of people. You have ignorant and lawless people. There are people who don't know the law of God. Then you have justified people. Justified people are those who come and see the law, understand that they're lawbreakers, and then come to Christ for justification and forgiveness. And then you have disobedient people. They're the ones who now know the law, but reject it. The reason I present it in that order is because that's the intended order. Everyone begins as an ignorant person, but the goal of the law is to drive us to Christ. And yet some become disobedient. So how do we use the law? Well, when we talk to ignorant people, we treat them with compassion because they don't know. That's how Paul views the law. When we deal with justified people, those who are saved, we treat them with compassion because as Paul would tell us, we, believers in Jesus Christ, are free from condemnation. You know, we still are expected to follow the law, but when we don't, we're not condemned. You know, even if, like we said last week, the greatest perfection is the desire to make progress. So we treat ignorant people with compassion. We treat justified people with compassion. How do we treat disobedient people? And what I would say is that we continue to treat them with compassion. Paul says in Romans that those who are living disobedient to God are already reaping the wrath of God. If it's true that the gospel is, and the law of God is to bring you to full humanity, then wouldn't you agree that to live in some way contrary to your full humanity is to live in wrath? So why would we pile wrath on those already reaping wrath? When you come upon a starving person, do you explain to them why they need to eat? Or do you give them food? When you come upon somebody who's disobedient, 
Do you explain to them their disobedience? Or do you give them the bread of life? This is why the church needs to be this type of community, the demonstration plot of God's grace. We must be the show people of God's goodness. People must belong. Know that they are loved before they will believe. Now, treating people with compassion doesn't mean that we condone their sin. Right? We don't condone everything that happens. This is what Hymenaeus and Alexandra were doing. They were condoning people's sin. Paul says, I cast them out. Uh, in the New Testament, when you cast somebody out of the church community, the intention is always that they would return, that the community bonds would be so strong that they couldn't live without it. And so he says, I cast them out so they would learn not to blaspheme. But it's important to know that they were teachers. They're claiming to teach other people, and what they're teaching them is that, that many of the ways that they are living, they're condoning these lifestyles contrary to God's law. For us, the reason all this matters, you know, if we ask the question, why did I spend all of this time talking about compassion, um, the answer is because we want to be leaders. And if we're going to be leaders, we need to know how to navigate this. We need to know how to have compassion. So there's three things we need. First, we must know the law of God. I've spent a lot of time talking about how we handle the law of God. But it's not just how we handle it. It's what's included in it. What is the content of the law? And so Paul gives a list of examples, not trying to be an exhaustive list of everything that's a sin, but he gives a list, as he often does, that's intended to be representative of some of the things that are contrary to the law. And he defines disobedience like this in verse 10, whatever is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the, ble of the, gospel of the glory of of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The, the word that he uses there in verse 10 of, the, of sound doctrine, it's a word that means healthy. So in other words, if we're saying that the gospel and the law is intended to bring you into healthy and full humanity, then what he's saying is that anything that is healthy and sound doctrine is what the law of God commands. Now some of the commands that he gives in the list that we read earlier, liars, perjurers, people who strike your mother and father, I think we can look at those and, and kind of draw a line from them to the Ten Commandments, right? We can say, well, okay, if you strike your father and mother, you're clearly not obeying your father and mother. You know, if you're a liar, you're a perjurer, if you're a murderer. But there's others that are debated, and they're debated today like they were in Paul's day. And so it's important for us to understand that and explain it. And I'm going to give three. There's a triplet that's kind of all together, sexual immorality, men who engage in homosexuality, and enslavers. And I want to talk about those three because there are people in our day today, like Hymenaeus and Alexander, who would teach something contrary to what God's law teaches. And if you're going to navigate it, you need to know that. So the first one we talk about enslaver, this is the least controversial because we all agree that slavery is wrong. But in the New Testament, there's two ways that Paul discusses slavery. And in one case, he talks about slaves and masters. And when he talks about that, he never explicitly condemns it because he's talking about an economic system in the first century where you could use your life as leverage if you didn't have collateral. But here, what Paul is talking about is forced enslavement of another person. He's talking about the forced enslavement that the world in America experienced when people from Europe and other countries took African people violently as slaves. And he says here, rest assured, that is not according to the law of God. It's a sin. People who do that don't make it into the kingdom. Now, even the first form of slavery, slaves and masters, what we might call indentured servitude, over time the gospel changed that structure as well, so that we don't see that as a valid form of economic structure. You know, you don't have indentured servants where they work for you, but you don't pay them, you know, you give them housing or whatever. In all cases, slavery is not full humanity. It is not full humanity. And for you to violently perpetrate that on another human is not God's intention. Here's the second least controversial of the three that I mentioned. 
sexual immorality. The word in the Greek has the root word porneia, which essentially is a dis disordered sexuality. All throughout the scripture, what Paul would say, and he's consistent and clear, not only Paul, but in, but in Christ, Jesus himself teaches that any form of sexual activity outside of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman is wrong. The reason that it's wrong, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, as he speaks to the church, he says, look, for you to engage in that, like you, what you were made for was a relationship with God. You were made to give glory to God. And for you to give glory anywhere else, or you to, you to use your body in a way that it wasn't intended, or for you to engage in behavior that is contrary to what God has called you to, is to, is to basically, uh, to, to essentially bastardize who you are, to give away who you are. To, to treat yourself as less than you are. But I also want to be clear about something. Uh, sexual immorality is not an unforgivable sin. And a lot of people grew up in the late 80s and 90s, and there was this thing called the purity movement. And it was, it's come under fire now as people go through deconstruction. And, but the purity movement was well-intended, it encouraged abstinence and waiting for marriage and all this stuff that's clearly in line with God's word. But what it resulted in was self-righteousness and shame. Self-righteousness and shame. Self-righteousness because some people felt like I'm please, more pleasing to God than you are. Shame because other people were taught that they've messed up in such a way that God can't love them. And that's not the gospel. There was a analogy that was often used, sort of a widespread thing, if you would go to youth retreats or even youth pastors would use it when inevitably once or twice a year you gave the sex talk to the kids. And the youth pastor or the youth speaker would stand up and they'd have a rose and they'd pass the rose around the room. And they'd say as it goes past you, everybody pluck a leaf off the rose. And the rose would go around the room and it was supposed to be a symbol of promiscuity. Every time a new person touched the rose, they took a leaf off, they took a leaf off, they took a petal off, a petal off. And eventually the rose would get back to the speaker. And he would say, you know, this is what you're like if you're promiscuous. Who could ever love a rose like this? And all the absent people cheered. Because they were like, I'm a perfect rose. And anybody who experienced sexual immorality wept in shame. You know, the reason, like it seemed fine in the context for people, the problem is, do you know who wants the tattered rose? Jesus wants the tattered rose. Je when you stand up there and you say, who could ever love this rose? It's like, Jesus could love that rose. That's the gospel. That's, that's using the law with compassion not bludgeoning people. God has, a, has an ideal for our sexuality, but if you don't live into it, if you've messed up, it's not unforgivable. That's why we have grace. The law says that sexuality is intended for a marriage between a man and a woman, and sexual activity outside of that is no way to be fully human. And then Paul goes on, and this is the most controversial of this triplet that Paul presents. It's translated this way, Men who practice homosexuality. That's a single word in the Greek. It's a complex word. It's complicated. But basically, what the word means literally means something like the active partner in a consensual homosexual relationship. That's what the word means, the active partner in a consensual homosexual relationship. And I want to say this up front. The reason that Paul mentions this is not because this is like the greatest sin of all time. He's contextualizing. Just like in our day, in Paul's day, in the first century, there was a lot of confusion regarding sexuality and regarding homosexuality and homosexual practice. So Paul is using a contextual example that really would have mattered for Timothy, just like it matters for us. But today, instead of de denying that Paul said this, there's a movement, particularly in the church, to redefine what this word means. So there's an attempt to redefine what Paul says. And so specifically, there are many in the church today, and this will be a debate that you as a believer in Jesus Christ will need to navigate. There's a, and this is why I'm saying it. This is why I'm bringing it up. There's a debate in the church today that what Paul has in mind is not 
homosexual practice, the way that I just define the word. But what he has in mind is actually homosexual rape or an adult engaging in homosexual practice with a child. That's what they'll say. And so they'll say, see, that's a sin, so homosexual practice is not a sin. This disordered homosexuality is a sin. But that's not what Paul says. What Paul says is he's expanding on the phrase sexual immorality and giving an example of one sort of sexual immorality. That it's the active partner in a consensual homosexual relationship. Now I want to, here's what I want to say about this. Paul is careful to distinguish someone who identifies as a homosexual person from the activity. It is not a sin to be a homosexual person. It is not a sin to be a lesbian. It is not a sin to be gay. And the way that, you know, we, I could spend another sermon just talking about the difference in our lives between the effects of sin on the world that we live in that, that impact all of us in ways that we don't like or ways that may be contrary to what God's ideals are versus our participation in sin. And there's a lot of times where we experience the impacts of sin all around us, but it's not a sin. It's not for somebody to be born as a, as a homosexual person or to struggle with homosexual thoughts or gain lesbian thoughts. It's not, that's not a sin. And we need to stop bludgeoning people with the law that makes it appear that someone who's going through that will never receive compassion from the church. The church is the place they should receive compassion. We don't condone the practice. But we say, you are still a person that Jesus loves. You are still, so when we talk about it, we navigate it as leaders, as Christians. We need to be careful that we speak. What is our charge? Our charge is love that flows from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That needs to be how we treat this. Christians must be compassionate, not wanting to beat people over the head with the law. If we do that, what does it say to people who are struggling? Here's the second thing we need, though. How do you do that? How do you learn? Well, we need to acknowledge our own need for mercy and grace. If you don't think you needed mercy and grace, you will never give it to other people. You just won't do it. And I think that's why Christians like to hold up certain sins as being worse than others, because we say, well, that one's bad, because I don't struggle with that, so I feel good about that. And those are the ones we rail on. Paul goes the other direction. Did you hear what Paul said? Listen to this. God judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The grace of Jesus will never overflow from you until you recognize how much of it you needed. You needed grace and mercy. That's why it begins to overflow. But he goes on, listen, how different is this? This saying is trustworthy. Of all, the, of all the sayings in his letter, to be like this, you want to know one that's a fact. I mean, you want to know one that I'm going to emphasize, that I'm going to put a double exclamation point at the end of? You want to know the one that's trustworthy? Listen to this. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Are homosexuals the foremost? Nope, I'm the foremost. Are murderers or perjurers or liars the foremost? No, I'm the foremost. I'm the foremost of the sinners. That's why I don't judge sinners. That's why I don't beat them over the head with the law. Until you can say that about yourself, until you sense and feel that, God's grace will not flow out of you. God's judgment will. Listen to what Paul says. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, as the worst of all sinners, in me, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. The reason that Jesus saved me, the worst of all sinners, is because when you look at me, Paul says, you should go, your God must be patient if he saved you. I mean, are you presenting yourself as a person who God was patient with? Are you presenting yourself as a person that God was really pumped to get into the kingdom. Until you experience the grace and mercy, you won't give it to others, and we won't have patience for the ignorant. We won't have patience for the disobedient. 
even others who are saved unless we recognize and acknowledge the patience of God towards us. We must acknowledge our need for mercy. And here's the final thing. We must stand firm. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare holding faith and a good conscience. Paul doesn't use the term warfare lightly, but here's what he would say elsewhere. The battle that you're fighting is not against people. The battle you're fighting is against the spiritual forces in the, in the demonic realm. When you, what's at play when you approach a person is what the devil says about them versus what God says about them. That's where the battle is fought. It's not against people. But how often do we leave the four walls of the church and we go out and we engage on social media or we engage in our daily lives and, and we fight against people? But that people are not who we're fighting against. We're fighting against the spiritual forces that are lying to them about who they are. We're fighting against the spiritual forces that enslave them so that they cannot be set free. And so what you need to do is stand firm. No wavering. Compassionate truth that flows from and into love. That is our charge. When we leave the walls of this building and we go out into our lives as leaders of the kingdom of God, we will face trials. We will face challenges on both sides to what God says. You will face those who sabotage your efforts. You're going to face misperceptions. You are going to pay for the flaws of leaders that come before you. And in some cases, you'll reap the benefits of the leaders who've come before you. But we go out and we lead with love. That is the charge of the leader. And that's the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for making us a people who are called, Lord, to lead others into the design and the intention that you have for them. May your word go forth from this building in our lives that we become people who demonstrate to the world what grace looks like. Pray this in your name. Amen.